Welcome into New York City. Adrian Broner's fighting Manny Pacquiao this weekend, but first he's going to be on this show about 15 minutes from now. Very special all-time great birthday and some NBA insight and more begins at this exact moment. All right, welcome back into Riders Block. Yesterday, we anointed the Golden State Warriors, Denny Green style, the champions in the Western Conference, the eventual 2018-19 NBA champs. That seems right. That's right. Eastern Conference, though, and who they're going to beat a little or prove me who's going to prove me wrong. A little more difficult to handicap. So we're going to catch you up. Some big wins for some big Eastern Conference teams last night. Let's start with the Bucks. Milwaukee continues to look like a legitimate threat in the Eastern Conference. A big win against Memphis. This is arguably the best team in the Eastern Conference for a variety of reasons. Mike Budenholzer, who was a Coach of the Year candidate a few years ago, not candidate, he won the award before he rose too high and was the head of a front office, has this team doing the things you need to do, the recipe, that alchemy, that mix, to be a real contender. They are the best team defensively in the NBA. They have the best defensive efficiency rating. They're offensively incredible. They're fourth. If you're top ten in both offense and defense, historically over the course of a season, that is what makes you a championship contender. Teams that are in the top five have an 80% win rate in terms of making it to the finals and getting it done. And, of course, Milwaukee's got the Greek freak and Giannis Antetokounmpo. I don't want to sleep on Boston. We talked about this a couple days ago, right? What Kyrie had to do for Boston to reach its goals. That looked pretty good last night in that win against the Raptors. It's a huge victory for Boston. I still like Boston in the long term, and I want to give Kyrie Irving credit where it's due. We were pretty hard on him. We were pretty aggressive toward the man a few days ago for selling his guys out, for creating some drama. Well, what a real man does is he admits when he, what a real leader does, he admits when he's wrong, it's hard to do, apologizes, it's hard to do, especially in the harsh spotlight that Kyrie Irving operates under. And he talked, and I thought it was impressive. He talked yesterday about calling LeBron James, about his teammates, about doing the right thing. Here he is. I had to uh, call Bron, you know, and tell him, like, you know, I apologize for, for being a 22-year-old kid and, you know, wanting everything, wanting everything right now, you know, coming off an all-star year starting and then, you know, this, this heck of a presence comes back and now I got to adjust my game to this guy. What that brought me back to was, like, all right, how do I get the best out of this group of the success they had last year and then helping them realize what it takes to win a championship. I cannot overstate how much I respect this and how much being back in the day a beat writer in the NBA, these kinds of words matter. Now, words are one thing. What do they say in Game of Thrones? George R. R. Martin, words are wind. But if this leads to an actual change in the chemistry in that locker room and the kind of leadership that Kyrie exhibits, if the things he said translates to the person and leader he can be on the court, I'm telling you, Boston is dangerous. And we saw it last night. Kyrie took a lot of shots. Kyrie played really well. But you could tell that team wanted to be out there with him. He was part of the group, not holding himself above the group. It's part of the reason they took down a really good Raptors team. Remember, Boston, top five defensive team, offensively 11 or 12. Kyrie can be Kyrie as part of the team. They can be incredible. Not, not sleeping on the Raptors. They just lost last night. They're still one of the better teams in the game. I do want to talk about the Sixers. I know it's a few nights ago, but that statement game and all the drama with Jimmy Butler and Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons and who's going to have the ball in their hands, they played a Minnesota team that you know this and I know it, that was a me versus you, mano a mano, Jimmy Butler versus the guys that do not like him in Minnesota kind of game. And behind the scenes, if you're talking to executives and GMs and players around the NBA, there is a lot of ugliness that people in that Minnesota organization are saying about Jimmy Butler, whether it's true or it's not. I've heard it. Trust me, Jimmy's heard it. And he played like a beast. He was awesome defensively. That Sixers team responded. That is a really good basketball team if, like with Kyrie, Jimmy Butler, their alpha, can make him the alpha of a group of guys that are following him, not buttonheads on the same team. I don't want to forget about the Pacers or disrespect the Pacers. I, I, don't, I don't buy them as a real contender, but they played really well this year. My problem is great defensively. I want to make sure I got it right. They're second this year in defense, second only behind Milwaukee in the NBA. They're only 15th offensively. I, I don't think they have the firepower, but they're doing really impressive things. They deserve a call-out. And speaking of call-outs, I do live in Brooklyn. I'm not a Nets fan. And I'm not pretending they're going to do any damage in the rim the postseason. But they did beat that Houston team. All hail Spencer Dewitty. What, 33 points? He got it done. It's an, East, it's an interesting Eastern Conference from top 
to bottom. And I'll tell you this, I, I think there are four, maybe five teams that are good enough to make the NBA Finals this year in the Eastern Conference and, uh, you know, earn the right to get utterly and totally slaughtered by the Warriors. I'm not stepping back from that at all. Here's my prediction of how I think things are going to turn out at the end of the year in the regular season. Who I think will be left standing atop those standings. I think the Bucks are legit, and I'm not sleeping on the Raptors. I do think the Celtics will make a really, really big run. And if I'm right here, if Boston finishes three, I like Boston to eventually make the Eastern Conference Finals. I think they can be that good. And when Kyrie and this group of guys start to get along, if that actually happens, and it's an if, I like them a lot more than I like the Sixers. And with all respect to everybody underneath the Sixers, those are nice teams with nice stories that aren't challengers. And I think Eric Spolster is an amazing basketball coach. Love what the Nets have done. The Hornets' future, I think, maybe finally Jordan's got the right people in that organization. But it's the top four teams that are the real contenders. And for me, I know it's one game. I know it's one moment. But I love everything about the Celtics. I love everything about what they can do. And you see there, so does Vegas. Because Vegas sees it and Vegas knows it. It's about talent, who's peaking at the right time, and what to do in a seven-game series. Boston and the Raptors are the best odds. I just worry a little bit about Toronto. Toronto's top ten in offense and defense. I just worry a little about the offense in the postseason. And I've seen this story before, albeit without Kawhi Leonard, where Toronto goes to the playoffs. All of us NBA guys say it's finally going to happen. And what happens is the same old story, heartbreak in Canada. Give me Boston. Right now, today, if i got to predict on January 17th, give me Boston. A few days from now, I and hope you will be sitting back watching Broner versus Pacquiao. Should be a great fight. And one of those fighters, Adrian Broner, going to join me here on Riders Block in just a couple minutes. He's coming up. You don't want to miss this. We'll talk to the former champ here in just about two minutes. All right, welcome back into New York City. As promised, joined now from Las Vegas, Nevada, by Adrian Broner, former multi-division world champion. He's fighting Manny Pacquiao for the WBA regular welterweight belt this Saturday in Las Vegas. And Adrian, appreciate you making time. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, guys. Man, I'm I'm excited. I can't can't wait for the fight. How are you feeling? Few days before making that pay-per-view debut uh, I feel great and um, this is my first uh, debut on pay-per-view and um, it won't be my last well this is my first time main event on pay-per-view and, and it definitely won't be my last does it how does it feel does it feel different is the energy different just getting ready for what for you hopefully is the beginning of a lot of these big-time moments um, it's definitely a different um, magnitude. It's a definitely different platform. Um, everything is just bigger, you know. But I'm I'm, all, I'm soaking it all in like a sponge, and um, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready. You've said that this fight is going to change your career. What does that look like? What does that mean? How does it play itself out? It means a lot, and and, and you know, uh, with with the win, you know, it, it will change my career. And um, everything, everything goes under the rug and on, on to a new start, new chapter in my career. You know, whatever the sport, whatever the, the endeavor in life, sometimes a lot of it's about proving doubters wrong. I know it's been true in my career. How much are, are you motivated by the, the opportunity to do that, to prove people who have doubted you that they didn't know what they were talking about? Uh, you know, uh, I'm really not worrying about the people who doubt me. You know, I'm just focused on getting a win. And, you know, uh, what can I say? They hated on Jesus. <laughs> I know, I know, I know they're going to hate on me. You've said that you're confident that you can not just win this fight, that you can knock Pacquiao out. Is there a game plan? Is there an approach that you and your team, without giving away, you know, the specifics, have come up with? Um, just watch the fight <laughs> and don't blink. That's all I ask you to do. Just watch the fight and don't blink. I'm in rare form. I train my ass off and um, I'm just ready to go. All right, I, I've been known to make the mistake of forgetting my beer in the fridge and having to get up. So you're telling me could be, could, I need to stay where I am. I need to be, like, could be a quick fight. Yes, yeah, sir. Don't, don't. 
uh, uh, make sure you got all your nachos and the cheese and don't forget the jalapenos. Keep it all at once. Keep it all in one place, man. It could be a quick night. I hear you're making me hungry. So do you, as part of your preparation, how, how much, in this case, Pacquiao, how much do you study your opponent, look at tape, and have that impact what you want to do? Uh, every day. Every day, and, um, you know, um, you know, I, I, I've just been focused. You know, I've, I, I've dedicated myself, and, and um, I'm, I'm determined, and um, I can't wait to go in there and uh, execute our game plan. We had a tremendous training camp, and I feel good. When you've studied Pacquiao and you've looked at what you have to do, what do you make of the fighter, the shape he's in, his age, his ability when he steps in that ring this weekend? Uh, I'm not looking at age. I'm looking, I'm looking to go against the best Pacquiao that, that ever showcased a boxing match. And um, that's who I trained for, and um, that's why I'm going out, out looking, looking to face. If, if you win the fight after a win, you, you'd have a lot of options. Keith Thurman would be one. What are you thinking? What do you want the next fight to be after the victory? Well, in boxing, uh, boxing is fight at a time. So I'm, I, you got to take it at one fight at a time. So I'm, I'm just focused on Manny Pacquiao. And um, after I beat Pacquiao, then we can go on to the next one. But right now, my main focus is uh, this fight. So it's Thursday, and we love that you're here. Obviously, you have media, media obligations. But what is your process? How are you going to spend the 24, 48 hours? Walk us through what Adrian Broner is doing once you're liberated from having to talk to people like me between that moment and stepping in that ring. Um, you kind of got lucky, man. I wasn't going to do none of these uh, interviews. You kind of got lucky. So, uh, you know, just cherish this moment. I usually don't, don't be that, this talkative uh, this close to the fight. I, I, dude, I, I appreciate I, I am I am cherishing it. I, I love it. I appreciate it. The shot behind you looks great. Just a couple more questions. We'll, we'll let you go. On the flip side of this, people are saying that if Pacquiao somehow is able to win, they think there'd be a Mayweather fight again. Do you anticipate Floyd Mayweather, whoever it is, fighting anybody in a professional boxing match again in I'm not here to talk about Floyd. This, hey, all right, it's over. Okay, pull it. Next one. It's over. This is, uh, okay, man. ESPN. Good luck, on, uh, no, good luck this weekend. Yeah. Everybody is, and that's okay, because Adrian Broner is going to get there. If he wins the fight, he's going to realize that people are, like me, occasionally going to ask about Floyd Mayweather. That is, you know what, it's a, it's a day of first here uh, on Writer's Block. First time I brought up Spencer Dinwiddie, I'm pretty sure, uh, on the program. It's our first happy birthday moment coming up, coming up in a little bit, and the first time we've had an interview cut short for asking a question. It happens. No hard feelings. I'm still thinking about putting some money down on Broner, and we appreciate his time. That was that was that happens in radio over on the CBS Sports Radio Show. It's a little different for TV. We're experiencing something together here on CBS Sports. This is the beauty of live television. All right, we're gonna go inside the numbers in just a moment, having had, uh, as you heard Adrian Broner say, that very lucky opportunity to visit with him. We will go inside the numbers on some baseball when we come back to the program in just a moment. Please don't go anywhere. All right, welcome back into, uh, into New York City. That was interesting. Thanks to Adrian Broner, question mark? No, no, thanks to, appreciate him being on being on the show. So obviously there's some football this weekend and we haven't talked about either of the championship games. We put together a little bit of some info for you, something we think you'll like, starting with a great matchup in the NFC Championship. Since these two franchises last raised a conference championship banner, they have endured changes and challenges that few franchises have ever faced in NFL history. Once the greatest show on turf, the Rams had established a new era of offense in St. Louis, thanks to the genius of Mike Martz, the arm of Kurt Warner, and the legs of Marshall Falk. But having departed the show-me state for Hollywood, today's Rams are the greatest show in L.A., thanks to the brilliance of Sean McVay, the leadership of Jared Goff, and the talents of Todd Gurley, who insists there is still more to come. Feels good. Real, real, real good. Great, actually. But this ain't shit. We still got one more. 
For Houdat Nation, their last title is a reminder of how far they've come. From Bounty Gate to a rebuilt roster of stars, including Alvin Kamara, Mark Ingram, and Michael Thomas. These changes have occurred while still under the familiar leadership of Sean Payton and Drew Brees, who recognize the struggles the Saints have overcome. As a coach, this is my fourth one, and you, you recognize uh, the journey is, there's a lot that goes into it. Three, three NFC Championship games in you know, 13 years, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard game to get to, uh, that's for sure, and, and so we, we won't take that for granted. On Sunday, the Rams and Saints will look to complete their roads back to the Super Bowl by raising the NFC Championship trophy once again. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be an incredible game. It's obviously not the only game. And as a guy whose kids were born in Kansas City, and I wrote about the Chiefs for a long time as a newspaper reporter, I'm particularly excited about the Chiefs hosting the Patriots at Arrowhead in the AFC Championship game. Here's a little on that showdown. He's throwing deep. He's got Tyreek Hill wide open. Touchdown, Kansas City. Throwing the long ball right for Gronkowski. Separation makes the open the shoulder catch. A game winner for Gostkowski. And the Patriots prevail. 43 this to 40. This isn't their first rodeo here, so they've, they've done this a few times. and It's huge. I mean, these fans, you feed off that energy that they bring every single week. It'll be a good game. They're a good team. And uh, we played them earlier this year. You know, I know... You know, everyone thinks we suck and, you know, can't win any games. So we'll see. It'll be fun. And these teams may very well meet again. The Chiefs kingdom will host the AFC Championship for the first time ever. We have some really talented people who work here at CBS Sports ASU. Both of those packages were awesome, and I got—I do. I have, I have actual goosebumps about the. I'm not even a Chiefs, I'm not even a Chiefs fan. I'm a Bears fan, but I like that organization. I like the owner. I like the quarterback. We'll, in fact, here on this show tomorrow, we'll do a deep dive on each of those games. I'll give you my predictions, and of course, between now and kickoff of each game, every single angle you need will be covered here on CBS Sports HQ. Do want to talk a little baseball? There's this thing called free agency going on. Even if the news that's come out has uh, has made that hard to believe, we're gonna go inside the numbers on some of the free agents that are out there. There's one of them, Bryce Harper, and we'll start with the numbers one and three on inside the numbers here. As in Bryce Harper and Manny Machado were drafted first and third overall in the 2010 MLB draft. They would go on to make their debuts just two months later. Obviously these dudes are very talented. We get to 33.8 next. This one's amazing to me. Manny Machado has a career war. Wins against replacement of 33.8 through just seven seasons. Bryce Harper is nearing that 30 mark. He's at 27.1. Put in perspective, the only active player with a higher war and fewer years played in the big leagues is Mookie Betts. Next up is 23. Harper was just 23 years old when he won the MVP award back in 2015, making him the youngest unanimous MVP winner in the history of the game. Machado is still seeking the MVP crown and a little information on where he might try to do that. 198 is next up. In that 215 season, Harper posted a 198 OPS plus. That's the second highest OPS plus any active player has ever posted in a season behind only Mike Trout's 199 OPS plus this past season. As you might know, Trout's pretty good too. Next up is number two. The Dose Machado, in his young career, has won two Gold Glove Awards, including a Platinum Glove Award in 2013. That's the award that's given to the best overall fielder, not just by position, in baseball. How about 10? Both Harper and Machado have combined for 10 All-Star games in their combined 14 years in the league. Harper has been to the All-Star game six out of the seven years he played in the majors. 184 is next. Harper has 184 home runs through his first seven Caesar seasons in the bigs. Manny Machado has 175. Baseball's all-time home run leader, Barry Bonds, through his first seven seasons, 176. Both these guys on pace, obviously. And finally, 112, another big-time free agent that was just reportedly snatched up by the New York Yankees on a three-year, $27 million deal. Adam Alavino had 112 strikeouts for the Rockies last season out of the bullpen. So the Yankees spending money 
doing it in that bullpen. And if you live in New York or you watch baseball, you know Yankees fans have a tendency to freak out about that bullpen. It's a hell of an investment. It's be really interesting to see where Harper and Machado land. Seven years, eight years, nine years, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And of course, when that news comes down, the first place that you will hear about it is here on CBS Sports HQ. We got you covered. We know what you need. We know the information you need. We'll get it to you as soon as it's out there. I do want to take a minute to wish happy birthday to one of the greatest athletes and most important figures just in American culture of all time. Today would have marked the 77th birthday for the remarkable Muhammad Ali. This week, in fact, I love this, Louisville Airport announced that it's renaming itself after the hometown legend. From a Kentucky kid to a 14-time unified world heavyweight boxing champion, the world's greatest was just that, becoming one of society's biggest and most looming figures in and out of the ring. From his social activism, to his humanitarian work, to his competitive trash talking, to the remarkable strategy and power he exhibited in the ring, today we celebrate everything that defines Muhammad Ali. And just on a personal note, the guy for me, and I'm young, all of us are too young to really remember, is an all-time favorite and he was really one of the first athletes at the level that he did to bring together, whether you like this or you don't, the celebrity, the sports excellence, and the social activism, the politics, whatever you want to call it, that triumvirate we see so often in sports. And the guy was really funny, too. So wherever you're looking down from, big guy, up in the sky, we love you. We're thinking of you. Happy birthday to Muhammad Ali. We uh, love doing the show. We're back tomorrow. hope. You're back with us here. And, and next week, really excited. We got we always try to get big guests for you. Tony Dungy's gonna be on, on the program. I think next Tuesday. And you know, sources tell me he won't suddenly end the interview if we ask him a question he does not like. All of that said, thank you to Adrian Broner for making some time and good luck to him. I've interviewed Manny Pacquiao many times. That's never happened. All right, so uh, CBS Sports HQ continues. And as always, in about 30 minutes, 30 minutes from now, Sportsline's going to get you prepared to make every decision you need if you're looking at the lines and trying to figure out which direction you should be going in the various games that are out there. I'm Bill Ryder. This is Ryder's Block. Thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow.